Hosea chapter 9. Last week, we began a message entitled, A Dried Up Root. Uh, We did the first part of that message last week, and this morning, by God's grace, we're going to complete that message. So we have the second half this morning. So Hosea chapter 9 with me in your Bibles. This morning, we're going to be looking at verse number 13 through 17. And so I'm going to read that text of Scripture this morning. Hosea chapter 9, beginning at verse number 13, it says this. It says, Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. My God will reject them because they have not listened to him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. This is a dried up root, part two. Let's pray. Father, we are glad that we are here. We thank you for songs that we can sing unto your name. And Lord, as we focus on this passage of Scripture, I pray that you would help me to declare, thus saith the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'd all give us listening ears, and most importantly, listening hearts, to be able to see your word in the right way. Pray that you'd bless us as we have this time around this Holy Scriptures. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So last Sunday, we began this message And the first thing we saw was that God experienced nostalgia. He reminisced about the past. He longed for things to be like they were like in the earlier days. He remembered the patriarchs, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he longed for his relationship with the nation of Israel to be as it was when the nation was first birthed. The second thing we saw was that Israel experienced desertion. God's presence flew away. God's power also flew away from the nation. He removed his presence and his power, and they would no longer, from this point forward, for a period of time, endure the blessings of the Almighty God. Instead, unfortunately, they would encounter woe. They would encounter sadness. And now we come to point number three this morning. Point number three, there's desolation. There's still more gloom to come for the nation of Israel. Verse 13 there in our text, it says, Ephraim as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. Here, again, Hosea is using imagery as he did in verse number 10. A palm tree planted in a meadow is very picturesque. It's very beautiful. It's something that you would take a picture of or that you would place as a painting on your wall. It shows that God cared for and loved this nation, and it was special to him. And Israel was admired by him. However, a contrast comes rushing in very quickly. It says, but but Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Now, the word for slaughter here literally means a slayer or a murderer. This is the same word that was used of Cain concerning what he did to Abel back in the book of Genesis. So the children of Israel, and when I say children of Israel, I literally mean the actual young children, they're going to go out to somebody who is actually going to take their lives. More than likely, this refers to what will happen to their children at the hands of the Assyrian army when that army comes to conquer the nation of Israel in a short period of time after Hosea's prophecy. You see, God is persistent in warning them of the threat of judgment, which even, unfortunately, involves their own innocent children. He has already informed them of the approaching pandemic, sorry, epidemic, I'm in a pandemic. He has already approached them of the approaching epidemic of barrenness. But now the young children are going to be taken away from them by their enemies. But verse number 14 is there. It says, give them, O Lord, what will you give? Hosea is still speaking. This here is an imprecatory prayer. And an imprecatory prayer is one that invokes judgment or it invokes calamity on an individual or a group of individuals. 
Now, most often in Scripture, we see the psalmist David offering up imprecatory prayers according to his enemies or for his enemies. Here, Hosea is calling on God to apply the judgment that they were worthy of because they had not responded to Hosea's preaching, because they had not come in repentance to Hosea's preaching. Hosea is only affirming what God has already declared earlier on in the book and even in this passage of Scripture. It says, further on, it says, give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. So Hosea reinforces the judgment that God has already promised to bring to his people. Now, it's ironic here. This is very interesting. The judgment that seems to be at play here is a play on the fact that the Israelites at this particular time in their history, they were actually worshiping Baal. And here's what the God Baal had promised. When you worshiped Baal, you were promised fertility. You were promised a healthy womb. You were promised the ability to produce many children. So part of Baal worship was indulgence in immoral acts, immoral rituals, which were supposed to emphasize, supposed to. They were supposed to guarantee the production of many children. So if you worshiped Baal, you were supposed to be able to have lots of fruit, speaking of children, of course. But God here is actually using this particular judgment to hit the nation of Israel where it hurts at this time, because they have abandoned him, the true God, in order to follow false gods. You see, God was and is the giver of life and not Baal. And since they did not honor him for the life that he gave, he's going to take away the very blessings that they so deeply wanted, the very blessings that they so deeply desired. You see, what God was doing with this particular judgment was showing them who the true God was. And it was not Baal, because Baal could not produce life. God was saying, I am the true God. Only I can bless your womb. Baal cannot bless your womb. But since you think that God, Baal can bless your womb, I'm going to take that blessing away that you want so much. And we as Christians today must always remember from whom our blessings come. You see, incorrect worship puts us in danger of having our most prized, our most wonderful blessings taken away from us. We should tremble at the very thought of giving to another the worship that belongs only to God. It's easy to give someone else worship or to praise another one or another individual for the blessings that comes into our lives. The, but the Bible tells us that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. That's the God who created the world. Number four, there's also frustration. God is vexed at, his, at, at the disobedience of his people. It goes on there in the text. It says, every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. Now, why the mention of Gilgal? What's that about? Well, it's best to interpret this reference to Gilgal within the context of Hosea's prophecy. You've heard me say it all the time. We use scripture to interpret scripture. So in Hosea chapter 4, verse 15, it says, verse 15, it says, Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. And then it says, Enter not into, here's our word, here's our place, enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth -Avon. So that was the last time, or one of the last times, that Gilgal was mentioned. It is believed that there were altars or shrines set up to false gods at Bethel, which is why the prophet Hosea, he used Bethel, which meant house of God, and he called it at certain times Beth Haven, which meant house of wickedness. So Beth Haven was a term of spite that Hosea used for Bethel, which was supposed to mean house of God. So if Gilgal, our place of note here, if Gilgal was put together with Beth Avon, then we may not necessarily know the specifics of why it is placed there, but we know in some way that Gilgal violated its covenant with their God. And the text goes on. Hosea continues on. Speaking for God, it says, There I began to hate them. Now, hate is the term of note here. And usually the word hate describes one's feelings towards his enemies or someone that the individual does not like. The activities that took place here in this place, Gilgal, angered God 
so much that it brought about a fierce emotion within him. That's why the word hate is used in the text. We all know hate is a strong word. It's used here because that's the emotion that was brought out of God because his heart was broken by his people. And those who persist in disobedience, who continue headlong in disobedience, cannot be on God's side. We live in a world where almost everybody claims that God is on their side. Almost everybody claims that God, they are backed by God. I don't know if you've ever watched an award show like the Emmy Awards, or let's say in particular the, the Grammy Awards. And maybe there's an individual who's won a prize. I think the best example is someone who may have won, let's say, best rap album. And this individual comes up to the podium or to the stand, and they've won this Grammy Award. And they take the award, and <laughs> one of the first things that some of them would say, not all of them, but some of them would say is, I'd like to thank God for giving me the opportunity to win this award. Or some of them, some of them would even like to say, I'd like to thank my Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing me the opportunity to win this award. And all I could think to myself when I hear that is, God has nothing to do with that when you look at their records and what's playing in the, the media or what's playing through, through their albums. I would think to myself, God has nothing to do with the profanity, the immorality that you promote. But everybody thinks that God is on their side. And I want you to know, folks, that that is certainly not the case at all. Wherever sin is repackaged or redefined, God looks upon it negatively. So how do we determine what it is that God supports? How do we know whose, God, whose side God is on? The answer is simply this. We must examine it through the filter of Scripture. We must see what the Bible says concerning what goes on in the world today and concerning what others put out there, and then we're able to discern whom God's, who, whose, side, who God, whose side God is on. Sorry, didn't say that the right way. So we need to examine the Scriptures to determine who God supports. God doesn't support every politician or every nonprofit organization or every university or every sports individual, sports uh, person or every movie star or every rap artist. God doesn't support everybody. God supports the people who support what is written in the text. So the, those are the ones whom they're on God's side and God is also on their side. Moving on in the word of God here, it says, because, because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. So they're evil. Speaking of Israel's evil, their evil had reached such awful heights that there was only one thing, only one thing God could do at this particular point. It's like a, a pot that has been heated and it has water in it and now it's, it, it's boiling over. The only thing he could do now is expel them out of the land that he had given to them. The term my house here is not a reference to the temple, although you would normally think it is a reference to the temple. Here instead, it's a reference to the land that he gave, the promised land that Israel was so graciously given by God to live on. That was God's house, and now he's going to drive his people out of his house. But it's also interesting to note that this term, drive them out, these words, drive them out, is the same terminology used to describe what God would do earlier on in the history of Israel for the Israelites before they entered the promised land. God had promised to drive out the Canaanites out of the promised land and give that same land to the Israelites. But now we see the reverse happening. I recall Exodus chapter 23, 29 to 31. That's what God said. He says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. He says, little by little, I will, here's our term, drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, for I will drive out the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you, speaking of Israel at that time in Exodus, and, you shall and I shall drive them out before you. But here in this text of scripture in Hosea, we see the opposite happening. He's promising to drive out his own people out of the land that he had promised to give them because they were immersing themselves in the same Canaanite ungodliness. 
that those folks were practicing before Israel gave them the land. And God's Old Testament citizens were not immune to being disciplined by God, and his New Testament citizens are not immune to be disciplined by God either. Our covenants may be different, but God's character is still the same. God has not changed. The covenants may be different, but God is still the same. He goes on, he says, I will love them no more. So God promises to remove his affection, remove his benevolence, remove his devotion from this relationship. This is a marriage now that has gone awry. This is a marriage between God and Israel that is now, as we would say, on the rocks. That's where his relationship with Israel is. He's at his wit's end. His pot of frustration is now boiling over. And then he says, all their princes are rebels. Now the term princes here is important. The term princes here is a a note of the political or the civil leaders or the national leaders of the nation. So morally, they had turned away from God with the rest of the nation. And I personally believe that it probably was the princes, the political leaders, the national leaders who turned away from God first, and then the people eventually followed. I personally believe, now I can't prove this to you from scripture, by the way, but I personally believe it started at the top with those who were in charge, and then it filtered down into the rest of society. But nevertheless, we must note that it's not the religious leaders God is speaking to here. It's the non-religious leaders. They were still expected to obey God. See, these people were not let off the hook because their main business was not spiritual business. God didn't say, well, because you're not a pastor, because you're not a priest, because you're not this, it's okay for you to de- do evil. That's not what is being said here. Even those who were leading the country nationally were being held accountable for what they did. God holds these people, these princes, accountable for their actions, just as he held the priest accountable for his actions, just as he held the prophet accountable for his actions. He's holding now the princes, the national leaders, accountable for what they do. And the reality is that everyone without exception, everyone is called to submit to the authority of the sovereign God of the universe. Everyone on the face of the planet. Prime ministers must submit themselves to God. Presidents must submit themselves to God. Chancellors must submit themselves to God. Kings must submit themselves to God. Queens must submit themselves to God. They're all called to submit to God as well. They're all called to obey God even today as we speak. They're called to obey God. And if they disobey, they will one day face retribution. Some of them will face retribution in this life, but they will all face retribution in the life to come. You see, this is not just for religious folks. Some people would say, oh, that's just for those church people, those religious people. We out here can do what we want. That is not the case. Every human being is called to submit to the sovereign ruler of the universe, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. So don't you get bent out of shape, out of what national leaders do. I know some people, they, and it's unfortunate, there are some unfortunate circumstances that happen today. Even if we think about the history of Ireland, what has been instituted, the referendums, what has been allowed, things that are anti-God, anti-Bible, Bible, and just flat out sin. And people could get bent out of shape. How could they? That is so wrong. That is so evil. Yes, we must stand up for right. Yes, we must stand up for the truth. But we must also have the comfort of knowing that one day those people will stand before God as well. God is going to hold them accountable. They're not getting away with it. We may think, oh, they they can do what they want. We just have to bear it. That may be the situation, but they will pay the consequences for what they have done. Don't you get bent out of shape over what the government of Ireland does, or any other nation that you may be associated with, God is sovereign, and one day they will face him, even the national rulers. In Philippians, it tells us that one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Number five, there's eviction. So in the end, Israel will be expelled from the land. Verse number 16, it says, Ephraim is stricken. 
Now, to be stricken means to be, to be struck down. It's like somebody taking an axe and laying it against this root. It's a blow that is applied. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. So Hosea ends the way that he begins this section. He uses the language of trees that produce fruit. Because God has given the death blow to Israel, their roots will no longer function properly, and it will begin to dry up. That's why this message is called a dried up root. Their roots will dry up. Because no more nutrients can be absorbed through the roots, the tree will have no more life. It's going to bear no more fruit. No more blessings are going to come out of the nation. Israel lies now dying. And then it says, even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. So here he's talking about their precious children, even. This judgment is the complete opposite of what Baal had promised. Baal had promised fertility. Baal had promised the ability to have as many children as you want. God is saying, no, I'm the true God. You need to forget about Baal wants. But since you're not forgetting about what Baal wants and you're, you, you, you're rejecting me, I'm going to cut off your womb. God's judgment here is deliberate and it's strategic. At this, um, at this point, someone could probably raise the question, well, when these kinds of things happen today, like if someone has a, a miscarriage or someone unfortunately loses a child at a young age, does it mean that they're being judged by God? And my answer to that would be, no, it does not mean that. Now, it, it, it can mean, mean that, but it does not have to mean that. I would emphasize here what I emphasized earlier on in the book of Hosea when we were talking about this is that anything that comes into our lives, anything negative, anything that we don't like, anything that hurts us, anything that frustrates us, that comes into our lives, we need to be able to discern whether it is, number one, a trial, or whether it is, number two, a thorn. There are two options. It can be a trial, or it can be a thorn. Now, what is a trial? A trial is anything that God uses to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Anything that God places into our lives that we perceive, sometimes it's not negative, but we perceive it as negative to make us and to mold us into what he truly wants us to be. Sometimes he's trying to strip away all of the dependency upon others and this and money and all of these things to get us more secure in himself. God uses trials to make us more like Jesus Christ. And not only that, God uses trials to sanctify us to take away the filth, and to add that which is valuable according to his standards. James 1, 2 tells us to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It says, for you know that the testing of your faith, get this, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So when your faith is tested by these trials, what it produces in you is steadfastness, the ability to continue to persist in the right way, in the right course. But he doesn't stop there. This is what gets me. He says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. So what he's saying is, not only am I going to bring trials into your life, but I want you to allow those trials to do what I've placed them there to do. Now, I must admit, that's hard. Don't just accept the trials. Understand that you should allow the trials to change you and renew you according to the image of his son. Let steadfastness have its full effect. That, here's the purpose. Don't miss this. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, as we are right now, as children of God, there is a lot that we lack. There's a lot that I lack. And the way, unfortunately, that God is going to bring me into not lacking that thing in my life is through a trial. And it's the same with you. The way that God is going to bring that thing into your life that you lack is through a trial. He knows what is best. Now, I must admit, that is hard to deal with. But that's just the reality of what the scriptures teach us. Life is not a bed of roses. And the Christian life is not a bed of roses either. As a matter of fact, when Jesus taught in the New Testament, what he said was, sometimes when you become a Christian, in reality, your, your problems really start. There is a great cost to being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't believe what people tell you when they say, oh, you become a Christian and all of your problems are going to go away. That's not true. 
That's not what the Bible teaches. So the question is, is it a trial or is it a thorn? What's a thorn? A thorn is what God uses to prick us so that we can feel pain in order to get us to straighten up and fly right. A thorn is what God uses to prick us so that we can leave that road, leave that track, and place our train on a different track. It's to get us to where God wants us to be. So how do we decide which is which? Is it a trial or is it a thorn? Well, you and I personally need to get alone with God, and we need to discern that. This is why it's important for you to have your own personal relationship with God. I can't tell you. Your brother or sister in Christ may not be able to tell you. You need to get with God and ask him, is this a trial or is this a thorn? What is it, God? Show me where I'm wrong in my life. And if there's nothing there, then it could be just a trial that God is taking you through. And if it is a trial, then you're just going to have to trust God through that trial. That's not easy, but it is possible. Paul said in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, he says, much more will I rather glory in my infirmities. He says, for when I am weak, speaking of himself, when I am weak, he says, then I am strong. So we all personally need to decipher, discern, get before God in our own lives for the trials and the tribulations or the thorns that we may be experiencing at this point. Is it a trial or is it a thorn? Verse 17. He says, my God will reject them because they have not listened to him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. They're, they're going to depart. They're going to be dragged out because of not only not listening to God, but also not listening to his prophet, Hosea, whom they rejected. But what I would like to bring your attention to in verse 17 is the beginning of that sentence, the beginning of that verse. Notice how there's a switch here. Hosea previously had just been calling him God, 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 or Lord. But notice 17, with 17, it gets personal. Hosea says, my God. In other words, Hosea declares that he has a personal relationship with God. He's not just God, although he is God. Hosea says, he's, he's my God. And this is what he's going to do. Just because he was the God of Israel official, officially did not mean that all the people of Israel knew him personally. And likewise, just because God is the creator of every man does not mean that every man knows God personally, even today. He created everybody, but everybody doesn't know him intimately. Everybody doesn't know him personally. So the question this morning for maybe even some of us to answer is, is he your God personally? Do you know him personally? Are you indwelt by his Holy Spirit? Do you have an intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, Scripture warns us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, which is preach what I'm doing now, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And it goes on, it says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, even though these people were performing many outwardly religious activities, God didn't know them, and they didn't know him. That's the reality of what is written in Matthew. They did not possess the new heart. They did not possess the new spirit that Ezekiel spoke about in Ezekiel's prophecy. Therefore, these people were transmitted to eternal punishment. See, a true believer doesn't only have a head knowledge of God. A true believer also has a heart knowledge of God. So I want us to ask ourselves this morning, do we have a new heart? Do we have a new spirit? Are we truly converted children of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you would say no, or if you would say, I don't know, I would encourage you even right now to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to receive his grace, receive his forgiveness, receive a new heart, receive a new spirit 
even right now by faith and by his grace. Let us pray.